Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Digital Grocer, season five, episode three. Less than two weeks after Digital Grocer, season five, episode two was published on May 1st, 2022, exposing Instacart's plan to IPO. On May 11th, 2022, Instacart files confidential IPO paperwork with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission for an initial public offering. I'm your host, Sylvain Perrin, joining my co-hosts, 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 hosts, sorry. Co-hosts. It's been a long weekend, <laughs> people. Uh, Mark Ferris, Mark, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. It's, um, it's a lovely Sunday afternoon. Um, I know our team loves it when we date these, these videos because <laughs> they want them to be Greenfield, but it's, it's hot out. It's, well, you can date it by my, what I'm wearing and the length of my beard at this point. Yeah. <laughs> In any case, we have a juicy topic that we want to talk about. Um, you know, we broke the news prior to Bloomberg of Instacart, uh, you know, filing for their IPO. The news kind of blew up last week. And part of that whole process is Rick Watson put a post out on LinkedIn that got a tremendous amount of views, you know, uh, ignited some really interesting conversations around yeah. who could potentially acquire Instacart, what's going on in the market, and so on. What are we hearing? What are retailers feeling out in the space? So we figured we'd invite Rick on the show yep. and kind of jump in, have him talk about his post, and then we'll just take it from there and see what kind of conversation we can get around the subject. Yeah, and, and I think the audience is going to want to know if, if Rick has uh, got a haircut since last time. So Oh, I, that's it. Yes, it was. It was. It was long hair. Yeah, I remember that now. <laughs> so without uh, further ado, here uh, here's Rick Watson, CEO and founder of RMW Commerce Consulting. Hey, Rick. Hey, guys. Uh, good to see you, Mark and Sylvain, again. E-commerce expert Rick Watson from RMW Consulting weighs in on Instacart. Hey, so Rick, share with us your post, what you had put out on LinkedIn for the listeners out there that may not have come across that post. In terms of the news, um, you know, it was kind of based on the recent articles that came out after the IPO or the IPO announcement, which was a confidential filing. So we didn't really learn a lot about the business from it, but it, it, it's kind of speculating about a couple of different things. Number one is what are the, if, um, is acquisition on the table for them? And if so, who would be the right kind of acquirer? Uh, that's kind of one question and we can talk about that. Second question I think is why now? Mm-hmm. You know, of all the times uh, that we're looking at that a, at a company could IPO, well, why this moment? Uh, and mm-hmm. I think there's some obvious and maybe some non-obvious answers to that question. Uh, and then three is sort of like, what's the, what's the future hold for Instacart? Uh, you know, what's, what's going on with the CEO? How's that been going? And where, where, where does the company go from here? You know, in, right. in, a, in, a, in a, in a, in a, in a world where retailers are getting more sophisticated with supply chain and last mile and, and running a number of experience where three, four years ago, Instacart was the only game in town. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Three, yeah, three great good. questions. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, those are great questions. Instacart IPO. Why now? And, and let's start with like question number two, right? Just kind of uh-huh. set the stage. Why why now? The if you look what we're seeing in this space, right? So this is a company that has repositioned itself around its technology, its ability to license its core technology, access to its advertising engine, and all those great things. Um, you know, we do a lot of research with our friends over at uh, Brick Meets Click, uh, David Bishop and his team. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also use ancillary firms to help us support other styles of research. And what, what we've seen for the month of April, uh, sales are down to $8.1 billion, uh, decline from $8.6 billion from the previous month. And we can only assume as we get into deeper into the, the summer months, we're likely going to see a dip in sales. If that is the case, and and that combined with the conversations we're hearing on the mark on the street from Instacart pushing features to drive conversion, to drive traffic on their core platform, we can only assume is that they're seeing a decline 
with respect to their sales. And this is the peak period for them to create the best liquidity event for their shareholders. Hmm. There, there isn't going to be a surge, even if there is a surge in, in the COVID-19, it's not going to return to the 9 billion that we saw you know, April of last year, April, May of last year. So we're not going to see that. So this is, this is the best event for them. Uh, also, you know, they're touting their MFC with a, a, a retailer on the East Coast. That's a shadow game that does not exist. Um, I think Fiji has put enough band-aids on the business to be able to get money back for it. Yeah. Yeah. We, <clears throat> to Sylvan's point, we have, you know, they, they came out with a fabric announcement. Uh, and all of a sudden that's gone very quiet. We do know that, um, after Fabric, they went to a company called Dematic, who works very closely with with uh, Walmart, and Dematic refused to uh, partner with them uh, with their technology. Uh, so our, our we have it on good authority that the Publix experiment, the Carrot Warehouse, is is exactly that. It's just a, a dark store with gig workers going in the front and coming and taking deliveries out the back. Well, and, and investments in MFC have paused. I mean, yep. in, in the nation, cap, capital is not being put down on the table, which which ties into probably another reason. This rapid expansion of Kroger across the country with, with Ocado, I think also sets probably some fears within Instacart. Um, we also know that some of their large U.S. Uh, retailers um, have already started building out their own solutions um, and have yet to disclose to Instacart that there's uh, that they will be leaving uh, the, uh, the Instacart network. I mean, what, what you're describing, Sylvain and Mark, is that this is kind of a falling, you know, I, I call it a burning platform. You know, mm. you know imagine you're you're in the middle of, the, of, of a lake on a, on a dock that somebody sets fire to the end of it. I mean, if you wait too long, you're going to have to jump off. And uh, if you wait another year, you know, I imagine, you know, if you're Instacart, your top customers, Albertsons and Walmart and Kroger, what, what, what percentage of revenue do you think that represents? You know, likely a very high percentage. And so I think one of the things that's at least apparent to me is the loss of any one of them would be a significant hit to the business that is not returning soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and so, if if you think that that is likely to happen over the next two years, which it, it prob probably is, um, and what that could do to the valuation, it's not like you can grow yourself out of that in the midst of headwinds of pe you know people returning to stores. Uh, you're probably fooling yourself. Yeah, I would I would agree. I mean, we we always assumed that at some point they would have protected themselves on two fronts in North America specifically, like in North America, what they would have done is they would have jumped more heavily to other, you know, verticals, which they've tried, right? The best buys of the world mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and big lots and so on. Um, we also assume that at some point they would have really tried to penetrate the European, uh, even the uh, Mexican or South American market in, in through acquisition or somehow and that diversification just n was never a priority for them. And I, and part of me just wonders is that maybe they just saw the, as the adjacent revenue that, you know, is tied to groceries, CPG dollars, data dollars, research and so on, just so easy for them to grab, but not realizing to your point, you lose one key retailer or two key retailers in the mix. It's a domino effect on your other sources of revenue at this point, right? It has it has a knock on effect. So you don't have that diversification to, to fortify. It becomes very concerning if you're an investor. And that's it's it's scary. It's scary in the sense that and I'm reminded I remember you just said something, Rick, that triggered me thinking of something. <laughs> I remember a, a retailer telling me a year ago, a year and a half ago, since you know we've been in business for over 85 years. 
do you think we're not going to learn how Instacart runs their business and not replicate it ourselves <laughs> under under our own terms? In fact, we're signing deals with them, a deal with them just so we can learn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, that's that's not a good sign, uh, generally, and and in in particular, every grocery retailer has a head of supply chain. Uh, you know mm-hmm. that you can point to that understands distribution, that understands warehousing. You know they may not understand last mile, but it's not like it's a foreign concept to them. Uh, whereas Instacart, I still can't point to the their chief supply chain officer. Like, where, where like if 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 they if they're out there, please please stand up. <laughs> you know, and maybe 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 contact one of us and and tell us what's going on because i you know it, it's usually pretty obvious who that person is and and they're communicating with the market about what their roadmap is and those sorts of things well it's i agree with what you're saying i would say it's even more interesting is who's in charge of operations at instacart mm-hmm. i listen you now we've it's a marketplace into... business so if you like when i did these searches all operational roles are have to do with the marketplace, which means like a software matching. It's the gig stuff. You know, right. it, it's nothing. It's not to do anything with MFCs and you know all, all yeah. these other things that they're going to need in the future. Right. And, and so, Rick, what are you, what are your thoughts in terms of why now? Like we, when Mark and I kind of said, "Hey, this is what we think," but you're probably looking at it from a different lens. Why would why would you think now is happening? Yeah, I think. I mean, the the short answer is that I think it's hard for them to raise money again. Mm-hmm. I think the private markets that that's one thing. It's like if you look at their last funders, Andreessen Horowitz, at high valuations, mm-hmm. like who, unless they're going to go to like SoftBank, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's almost like a WeWork situation where they've kind of grown, and I mean. Um, and who who's that next funder that is more going to take a riskier bet than your last uh, fundraising, particularly in this environment? You have to put out a pretty ambitious plan to get, you know, like another hundred, hundred fifty million, or like whatever it is they want. They just reduced their valuation from thirty nine to twenty four billion. I think it's going to go down from there. I mean, that's. You know, even that number is probably wishful thinking at this point. What do you think their revenue is? You know, um, you know they have a great consumer brand. You know, if they're you know what a billion and a half in revenue, it's not completely outside of the realm of possibility that you know that number is out there. But it, in this environment, is is the question in a normal growth environment? Maybe that valuation seems more reasonable. But going into this environment feels like it could fall a little bit more. What's in Instacart's future? Where do they go from here? Do I think that Fiji Simo is going to be the CEO for the next five years? No. Do I think their valuation has more downward pressure than upward pressure? Yes. Do I think they have a supply chain strategy? No. Do I think there's downward pressure on their retail revenue concentration? Yes. So all those things are pointing to like, let's get, let's get what we can, even if it's 80 cents on the dollar of what we just revalue the company at, and that sounds pretty good compared to 50%, 50 cents on the dollar if you if you don't know what to do next. And I think to your point, time isn't on Instacart's mm-hmm. side. The longer Instacart waits and that they don't have a great supply chain strategy, like if they had a great supply chain strategy, then time could be on their side because their solutions are improving and the, all these things. But the fact that we can't, still can't talk to a, look at a point to a supply chain solution that's improving and to me, that means retailers are like Kroger's innovating faster than Instacart in last mile, you know, with its partnerships and learning. So what do you need Instacart for in that situation? So yeah, all of yeah. those things, I think there's like three or four reasons that point to like, let's get some money out now for all of these investors that have fueled this tremendous ride. Look, I, I don't I don't want to diminish what the poor Vamita has done over the years. Great entrepreneur really took advantage of an opportunity, saw things a lot of other people did, you know, relatively easy access to capital. I frankly, 
you know, I've been sick with COVID the past two weeks. Instacart's like my favorite company. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when I need something and I don't want to go anywhere. So I, I, you know, I'm not saying I don't like it at all, but when I look forward, as opposed to looking backwards, I see more downward pressure. But now, and and I think you're right. I mean, it's and it's not like the competition is standing still. You know, <clears throat> DoorDash is sign, signing up more contracts with retailers that had long been with Instacart. So there's 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 a drive to the bottom here uh, for last mile. Yeah, okay. and you, you tie into that is the correction that we're seeing on the multiples in the market, the valuation multiples on Wall Street, and and Instacart has not, you know, through through the pandemic, they use the numbers to their advantage to raise crazy amount of money, but it's been fairly status quo in terms of some of the stuff they're doing like you know mercatus is mercatus is uh, starting the business with designing smart cards and taking them to market so and we ditched that idea 10 years ago so when they turn around and bought this you know we know it's about the capturing the in-store data but what a like what a waste of money for those three <laughs> three young entrepreneurs 350 million dollars on on restricted stock units that are likely going to break not a lot of money in the long run right Right. Or some of the other stuff that they're that they should be working on and they're not, and it's enough. This is going to be a very unfortunate story for the investors, uh, and, and quite frankly, the retailers. I'm concerned about. So Mark and I talk about this. You know, late at night, we're like, "Hey, do you think so and so could buy that?" <laughs> okay. And, <laughs> well, over phone call, right, Sylvan? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Or, okay, when we're, or when we're driving between retail retailer meetings. That's right. Who could acquire Instacart? Um, Rick, who do you think could, could buy these guys? Well, um, you know, before naming names, I would love to talk about the criteria. Like, oh yeah, yeah, it, good it, idea. You know, if, if I if I were the board of directors, who, what are the filters that I would apply to maximize evaluation? I I think. Someone that could value nationwide coverage, kind of a broad set of retail relationships um, across industries. I think I think Instacart has done a good job with that. Not necessarily to the exclusion of DoorDash or Uber, but there are only so many companies that have done as many wide scale partnerships. Um, you have advertising assets. You have the gig worker network. You know, those things aren't easy to put together. And if I look at sort of like, what's the crown jewel of Instacart? It's the, first of all, it's the buyer, it's the trust and the relationship with the buyers. You know, it's exp it's an expensive product, but it's a, also a, it's a good convenient product. And so that's, that's not worth nothing. Um, and then the advertising technology is to me the biggest piece that sort of ties it all together. And I kind of go back to the fact that if you're going to maximize valuation here, it, it needs to be a strategic. You're not just valuing based on revenue multiples or EBIT multiples. It has to be a client that needs advertising technology in a hurry. And there's a not just a, okay, we're going to create an advertising business. We're going to grow it over time. It could be worth this money in five years. It's like, no, like we're, we need advertising technology to survive because our competitors are kind of in the same space. Um, I think, that kind of overlap would be super like if you can maximize those factors then to me that's that's where you're going to maximize the valuation and what are you guys thoughts yeah I, i'd agree i would add if i was on the board i preferably somebody acquiring us that has a publicly traded vehicle already so i can just dump my shares and sell them get out <laughs> i think that would be beneficial uh or quick quite frankly, uh, see the shares grow over time, hopefully. Yeah. That would, that would be important as well. Mark? Yeah, I, I think there's um, there's opportunity, to, you know, of course we can speculate, uh, you know, using Rick's lens, his criteria, you know, Google, probably not. Uh, You know, we and the other the other criteria. I mean, Sylvan brought it up earlier. Is uh, you know competition, right? The, the FTC is 
certainly for the next three years, going to be looking at these opportunities with a very um, jaundiced eye. So, um, you know, Fiji came from Facebook, is Facebook looking to extend its reach into you know, the shops, the weekly shops that consumers do? I'm, I'm pretty sure they'd love to do it. But again, is the FTC going to allow that? And if it was a retailer, um, you know, as soon as as soon as the acquisition was announced, you can bet pretty sure that all of Instacart's retail clients uh, would be off that platform, knocking on Uber and DoorDash mm. more so than they are now. Yeah, I to me two names two names come to mind fairly quickly that I think the FTC is fine with i think one of them definitely would be doordash the you know doordash in this in consolidation in this space is not unheard of and i think there's enough competition quite frankly in this space left that the ftc wouldn't necessarily bat an eye and and i think that you you take a organization that is either an, a pre-existing well-established courier in this space or a distributor could easily come into this space as well. So if you take, could a UPS just turn around and say, let's do this. Could a FedEx, an arm of FedEx do this? Potentially, I don't know. Big stretch for them because they're not, they're not tech companies really, they're logistics, but maybe this is what's needed quite frankly. Um, do I think, uh, right, a Walmart or an Albertsons? Maybe not. But if if we have one of our friends on the East Coast that has European head offices um, with strong presence in the United States, but not national yet, could, mm -hmm. could they get by the FTC? Yeah, could, could they get by the uh, Del Hayes, get by the FTC? Apps? I think they could. And, and they, uh, the FTC may say, well, this is probably a good competition against Kroger and their strategy versus a Walmart or someone else. Yeah, I, I think Uber is off the table in its current form. Uh, I have no, you know, there's no way their investors would stomach it now. They're desperately looking for profitability and to merge with another company like this, you know, scale isn't going to get them to profitability. I think Uber has learned that lesson by now. <laughs> like, oh, we're just going to get bigger. The unit economics don't work. So getting bigger is not going to work. Um, so that's, that's a big challenge for them, I think. And by the way, they already tried this a few years ago and that's why the <laughs> previous CEO isn't there. Um, or at least one of the reasons I, I think if Walmart was a different company, Walmart four years ago could have done this. I think Walmart, theoretically, you look at the pieces, they seem to fit, but Walmart is in a build, build it ourselves mode generally right now. It seems like they've gotten back to basics. I mean, they're building out their supply chain. They just launched Walmart fulfillment services. They're, they're not as great as its target is in curbside, but they're 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 improving. I mean, they're, Walmart to me is like back to fundamentals. Like we're we're a great retailer. We're great. You know, we're going to be great at technology. We're going to be great at fulfillment. We're going to build an advertising business. Uh, you know, why do they need this? Uh, I, I think Google is not credible to me. I don't think they need the advertising business. Like to me, if Google had acquired Open Table five years ago, you could kind of stare at this and say like, yeah. Could, they could pick up Instacart, but the fact that they haven't, or you know, they don't seem to need acquisitions like this to make money. The names, to me, it kind of goes back to the top retail grocers. I think Kroger has been hed hedging their bets a little bit. Um, again, I think three years ago it was a little bit different world than it is now. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I think Kroger right now, like for them to venture to something like this, would be, be interesting because. ROI on an Ocado installation is at least two to three years, if not longer, before you see that ROI. And, you know, this expansion, this is a, this is a big gamble for them to expand as, as widely as they are doing today. 
because if if the traffic doesn't come to them on the Okada side in the Northeast or in the you know, in Florida Peninsula, there's no brick and mortar business in those markets to fall back on to drive traffic to. So you've invested into this infrastructure that overnight gets mothballed. That's kind of that's kind of scary in a sense. So I think would they venture put their necks further out than what they are today? Don't I don't I don't see it. Well, I think that takes us to the end of the show. So, Rick, it, it was a pleasure having you as as always. Um, so hopefully, you uh, you get over COVID and uh, keep keep pumping out your podcast. You want to give it? You want to give a shout out? Because I listen I listen to it religiously. Yeah, no. I, I last year I started a, a podcast called the Watson Weekly, and uh, it releases every Monday morning. And just talk about what's going on in e commerce, marketplaces, supply chain, just whatever I find interesting. Four or five stories a week, and uh, that, that's what it's about. So yeah, no more no more than fifteen minutes. Any 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 show. Yeah, it's a great show. So, Van, do you want to throw it out? Yeah, great, folks. Thanks for tuning in. And don't forget to keep your ear to the ground for our next episode to uh, drop. Mark and I are going to be taking off to the U.S. for two weeks straight of travel. We're going to be visiting some stores. We'll be filming on the road. Uh, We're going to bring you some insights in what we're seeing in our uh, favorite local retailers across all the cities we'll be visiting. And uh, hopefully we'll have some nuggets of information for you that you guys will enjoy. Thanks for watching and listening to our show. We've got more great episodes on digitalgrocer.com. And we'd love to connect with you on social media at Digital Grocer on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and at Digital underscore Grocer on Twitter. Like, subscribe, and click that bell icon so you never miss another Digital Grocer podcast.